it's three minutes past six. So I think very good time to start our third lecture. And today, Professor Nielsen will tell us about some inferences in population genetics. Yes, so um, what I'll do is I'll spend the first 20 minutes uh, reviewing things also from last lecture and talk a little bit more about it, gives a few details before I go on to other topics to make sure everybody on board. Before I do that, I'd like to hear if there are any questions about anything uh, from the last lecture. I will also review some of it right now. I think there was a question from one participant. No. No, okay. I will just go ahead now and uh, and start the lecture. But if there are some questions, you should feel free to uh, interrupt me. You can also do it through the chat perhaps. And then maybe uh, if I don't see the question, maybe Vladimir can help me keep an eye on also the questions that might be coming in in the chat. So last time um, we talked about, we started talking about population genetic theory. Uh, so we started trying to uh, understand mathematical theory that can describe genes and populations. And one of the basic models that we started with was this uh, right Fisher model. And the idea in that model is that you have uh, discrete generations. You have a number of individuals in each generation. We ignore the fact that they're diploid, meaning that like humans, there are two copies of the DNA. We, tra uh, we treat them as if they're haploid and if, as if they only have one copy of the DNA. And I was arguing that for almost all purposes, that's a great approximation. And then what we do is that we sample alleles, that is copies of the DNA, into the next generation uh, using a binomial sampling. Uh, and that is, is what the it's sort of a description of what the right Fisher model does. And if you repeat this over many generations, you'll get changes in allele frequencies that are due to this randomness of which alleles are being left in the next generation. And we call this change in allele frequencies, we call that genetic drift. Now this is a basic sort of description of how allele frequencies, frequency of mutations, they change in the, in the generation. To be able to link those kind of models to the data in an easier way, people in the 80s invented this, uh, these coalescence models, uh, models of coalescence trees. And I talked a lot about that also last time. So um, we talked first about the process if you only have a sample of size n equal to two. So you sample, two chromosomes or DNA from two haploid individuals. And then you look at their ancestry uh, back in the past. And we could, we could trace their ancestry in the past in a graph like this. And we talked about that the time where the two individuals have a most recent common ancestor, we called that the coalescence time for those two individuals. And we talked about that that coalescence time is under sort of the standard model we have been working under is exponentially distributed with a mean equal to 2n generations. So an average on the time until two individuals have a most recent common ancestor is 2n generations. Uh, and, but we often measure time on this coalescence scaling, where time is measured in units of 2n generations. So we could say that the expected time is one, that the waiting time to the first the most recent common ancestor, the coalescence time is exponentially distributed with, with mean one. Okay. So the arguments we gave came from considerations of what's the probability that two individuals have a common ancestor in the previous generation. And then we look at what would happen in our generations. We could say, see that the time until looking backwards in time in the discrete model, until you have a common ancestor is geometrically distributed. And from that, we could take the limit and then show that that converges into an exponential distribution in continuous time in that limit of very, very large populations. So the coalescence process, this process where you look at things in continuous time, is an approximation that works when the population sizes are relatively large. And typically, for most practical purposes, if you just have 100 individuals, it's for most things you want to calculate a pretty darn good uh, approximation. So this is this, I just said, here we see that this convergence of the geometric uh, to the exponential uh, distribution. So we get this tree. Well, we have a uh, point back here, back, back in time. Here, that is the coalescence time. And we saw that the, the coalescence time t was exponentially distributed. Again, we mean equal to one when you make your time in two in generations. All right. 
right. So we also talked a little bit about mutation and I'll just want to um, mention a little bit more how the mutation works. I was saying that we assume that mutations occur at a constant rate. And like just to make a little bit of a connection between the discrete mutation and the discrete model in the right Fisher model and how that then translates into mutation in the continuous model, the coalescence model. So in the discrete model, we can think of mutation as being the probability that when you sample an allele in the previous generation, that it changes to become another allele. So that we think of the, the mutation as a discrete probability in this, is this model, uh, or probability in a discrete uh, model, so that the total number of new mutations you would have in the next generation would uh, be binomial distributed. And if you just look at in the ancestry of one individual, look back in the past R generations, there would be an approximately, uh, or there would be a binomially distributed number of uh, mutations. And then in this limit of N becoming large, when we take that limit, that becomes, uh, that uh, the binomial converts to a Poisson. So it's in the, in the continuous time model, we can model the number of mutations that happen in a certain interval of time using a Poisson distribution. And the mean of that Poisson distribution is theta divided by two. So remember what, uh, what theta is here. Theta is uh, four and mu. Mu is the mutation rate. So the number of mutation that arises per generation, n against is the population size. And theta here, this fundamental population genetic parameter is four and mu. And what we can show then is that uh, the rate or the number of mutations in a certain interval of time is Poisson distributed with mean equal to the length of the time interval times theta divided by two. And that just simply comes from that we measure time in n generations. So the total amount of time is 2n times t because it's we measure in 2n generations uh, because we approximate this diploid population of uh, n individuals with a haploid population of two n individuals. And so um, the total amount of time that's passed is, is t times two n, and then we multiply with the mutation rate mu, that's the rate at each generation, and then we find that the total expected number of mutations that happen in a certain time interval is this here, t divided by t times theta divided by two. Okay, and that the distribution is a Poisson distribution. From that follows certain properties. It follows also that uh, if you look at the waiting time between mutations, so the waiting time, that is if you follow forward in time, here, we, if we go in this direction, follow forward in time along this, then the um, waiting time between two mutations here, that is exponentially distributed as well. And it's basically distributed uh, with parameters of theta over two, and the expected waiting time is then one divided by the rate two over theta. Remember, if you have some process that where things occur at a constant rate, then the waiting time to the first event that happens, the next event that happens, is equal to one divided by the rate. I was arguing you throw a dice, and the waiting time until you throw a six is one six, or the waiting time until you throw a four is one six, and, and so on, because the chance of getting Oh, sorry, it's six. Uh, or the waiting time to throw a four is six because the probability of throwing a six is one six. The probability of throwing a four is one six and so on. So you take one divided by that and the waiting time is six. So you would expect to throw a die six times in average before you see the first six. In the same way here, we would expect that the waiting time until the next mutation from any particular point in time along an evolution and lineage is equal to one divided by t times theta over two. Okay, so that's how mutations end up. They end up at, at, we can show that they end up at this constant rate and that uh, in a particular time interval, the total amount that occur is Poisson distributed and that the waiting time between mutations is uh, exponentially distributed. Okay, we can make simple arguments about then the expected waiting time to a coalescence as well. So we know that we make these single arguments that said that that the waiting time was equal to two n generations. Again, from this argument I outlined before, the same argument about the waiting time is one over the rate, and the rate of coalescence is one over two n. That's the probability of having the same parent in one generation. And then what we simply do is that we, if we want to know the expected number of mutations 
in a particular lineage of a tree, for example, a particular evolutionary lineage that is just simply the mutation rate times the time. So if we have two evolutionary lineages separating two individuals, then we, we find that uh, the total time, the expected time until they coalesce, that's 2n, that's two lineages we have to multiply with, we have to consider both lineages, and we, then we multiply by the mutation rate, so we get that the total expected number of mutations separating them is theta. Okay, and under this infinite size model assumption that all new mutations, they generate a new site, that you never have two mutations that hit into the same position in the DNA sequence. This number of mutations that occur is then also equal to the number of differences between two sequences. Okay, so that's all review from, from last time. We talked about then link, how do you link it to data? Because then we have predictions of how many mutations will two sequences differ by. So now we can start linking things to data and we get this prediction that the average number of differences between two sequences should be theta. And so we can make an estimator based on that. We can say, we can estimate theta using the average number of pairwise differences. And I gave this example of how to do that. You take between all pairs of sequences, you calculate the average number of pairwise differences. In this particular data example I have up here is four divided by three or one, one third. And that would be the estimate of theta based on these sequences using what's called Tatima's estimator, which is uh, this estimator that uses the average number of pairwise differences. All right. So I'd like to um, stop here for a little bit or for a second and then just think about uh, a few issues. Um, and I like to do that by uh, relating this to some data. So what you see in this table here is a, is a table for some human data published in a paper by Jeff Wall and co colleagues uh, a few years ago. And what they show here is they take different human populations and then for these populations, they calculate various statistics of the DNA sequences that get out from these uh, populations. This is genome-wide data. And you know that the DNA is organized into, you have uh, autosomes, that's the DNA that sits into the nucleus of the cell, but is not sex chromosomes. And then you also have the sex chromosome in the X and the Y. And what you can see up here first is the data for the, for the autosomes, okay. Then for different populations, you first have three African populations, and then you have an Asian population, the Han uh, is an Asian population, and then Basque is a European population, and the Melanesians, well, they uh, live in New Guinea uh, and a few other places, uh, and is this Southeast Asian population, a group of people that are also related to Aboriginal Australians. And then for, the, for those data, um, they also uh, um, calculate pi, which is this average number of pairwise differences. So if you look at the fifth column here, you can see that there's, that, that shows you, um, that shows you the, uh, the average number of pairwise differences. And I can see that my, my annotation here doesn't really connect to what you're seeing. Oh yeah, you can see that, okay. So, oh, that's theta, we don't want that. That's wrong, don't wanna look at those values. We want um, values of pi here. So if you look at these values, what you can see is that these African populations, Bandinga, Yaka, and San, they have much larger values of pi. So that you would estimate a higher value of theta for those populations. And you can look at the, for example, if you compare it to the Han Chinese here, they have a lower value of pi. Okay, so what does that mean? For example, the San have, have in Africa, they have a very small number of individuals and not very much, many of them, the same thing with the Biaka. Whereas there is, uh, I think more than a, a billion Han individuals in the world. So there are vastly, vastly, vastly many more hands. So how can we interpret this? Um, I'd like to hear for you, why would, why, what does this tell us? Given that what, just given the information I've given you, not considering any other external information that you have, but just what I've been telling you here. 
what does this tell you about um, these populations? How to interpret this result? Think about what does pi depend on and why could you get results like this? Feel free to unmute yourself and just speak up if anybody wants to say anything. Uh, probably that the ge ge genetic differences between Man Mandenka people is much higher than between Han Chinese people. Yeah, so that's what it means, right? That's what we can see. That's what pi means. But we know the pi and estimate of theta, and theta is equal to four in mu, four times the population size and the mutation rate. So what does this tell us about the biology of the populations? Why are there more differences, genetic differences between Mendenkas than there is between Han individuals? How can we think of this? Well, it's a trick question here because what I've taught you is that the number, average number of pairwise differences, what is measured here depends on theta, which, which is a product of the population size and the mutation rate, right? So if it's higher in the African populations, that must be because they either have a higher population size or higher mutation rate. In general, we don't think there's a much of a difference in mutation rate between different uh, humans, human, at least as population groups. There might be actually a little bit, some new research suggesting that, but generally we think that it's relatively equal the mutation rate of the, among different human groups. So it's not because I would say difference in mutation rates. And N is clearly much, much larger, the number of individuals for the hand than for the Africans. So the reason why this is a trick question is, the answer is that the model is wrong that we're using here. That really uh, the coalescence time between the African individuals is larger than between the Han individuals, even though there are many, 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 many more Han individuals, Han individuals, the Chinese individuals today than there are from these African uh, groups. And so, 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 so the model is, is, is wrong because they, in particular, because the, the Han individual has gone through a bottleneck in population size. They've had ex very explosive expansion, exponential population growth since the invention of agriculture, but they used to come, uh, arise from a, a population that was much, much smaller in effective population size. They've gone through several different bottlenecks. People originally originated in Africa, moved out of Africa. There was a bottleneck uh, constriction in population size during that event. And then there probably were other events, certainly an event right before the invention of agriculture, where a relatively small group started uh, Expon uh, exponential population growth for thousands of years. Uh, and so the model we had and we were using assumed a constant population size, uh, but there hasn't been a constant population size. And that's why in some sense, if you just take the number of individuals today, it makes the wrong predictions. So a lot of what population genetics is about is figuring out, ah, this model is wrong. How is it wrong? And how have these population sizes changed through time? What can population genetic data tell us about that? All right, maybe I'll just skip through this part here. All right. So just some important points on what we're talking about. The expected coalescence time is 2n. The expected number of pairwise differences is 4 in mu equal to theta. We use the average number of pairwise differences to estimate theta and quantify variation in the population. High or low values of theta might be caused by higher low values or higher in or mu, if the model is correct. All right. So we can do many other things just with the coalescence process for two sequences. We can, for example, ask the question, what's the chance in a particular gene or particular region of the DNA or for a particular site of the DNA sequence, what's the pro pro probability that two individuals are identical to each other? Okay, so that the problem is this, you send two copies of the DNA, what's the chance that no mutation happened in that history of the DNA? And we can sort of give two different kind of arguments for that. And the reason I give these two type of arguments, they illustrate very well the type of arguments that you use when you use coalescence theory for those various calculations. So in the, in, the, in the first argument, you can deal with it mathematically. You say we have a distribution f of t here. Um, that is this f of t, that's the distribution of the coalescence times. Then you can calculate 
the probability that two copies are identical by descent by calculating that probability conditional on the conditional on the the uh, coalescence times and then integrating that or the distribution of the coalescence time. Now, from the fact that the number of mutations that happen on a lineage is Poisson distributed and the two lineages, we can then calculate this first term here, the probability that the two genes are identical by descent. That then becomes this part over here. That is just from the Poisson distribution, the probability of having zero mutations in the history. And then we integrate that over the exponential that describes the distribute coalescence time. And when we do that, solve that integral, we get this result is one over theta. Okay, there's an alternative derivation. So this is all a more mathematical derivation of things, but there's an intuitive der derivation that is so, so just as rigorous. And that's saying that there's, you look backwards in time and then think about there's two different things that might happen. Either mutation could happen, looking backwards in time, or there could be a coalescence. They could find a most recent common ancestor. The waiting times to each of these events, they're all exponentially distributed. Conditional on the other one doesn't happen. And so we have, can use appeal to this theory for competing exponentials that says that the probability that any particular event happened first is the rate at which that event happens divided by the total rate at which events happens. So you can imagine that you're standing on a street corner, you're waiting for a taxi. Taxis are being sent out from three different companies at an equal rate. So the chance that you, the first taxi that comes to you is from taxi company one is one over three. Now, if that taxi company sends uh, out taxes at a rate that's twice as high as the two other companies, then the chance that the first taxi is from that company would be a half. Or, uh, it's, 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 it's two divided by four, the rate at, at taxes being sent out from the first company you're interested in divided by the total rate uh, of taxes appearing at that stream corner when you're standing. So similarly with coalescence and mutation events, now it's not different taxes from different companies that are coming, it's mutations or coalescence events, okay? And mutations happen on two lineages, each at rate theta or two, so the total rate of mutation looking backwards in time is theta. The total rate of coalescence is one, that's this exponential distribution with mean one, so the probability that the first event is a coalescence event, that a coalescence event happened before there are any mutations is then simply one divided by one over theta. One, the rate of coalescence divided by the rate of coalescence plus the rate of mutation. Okay, so that tells us that's the probability that if we look at the two lineages here, that no mutations hadn't before they found the most recent common ancestor here. Okay. So that's a different type of argument. It's just as valid as the other type of argument. And often this type of argument makes it much easier to derive many properties of population genetic data by looking at these exponential processes and try to derive things that way rather than the more mathematical way of formally integrating over the, uh, the distribution. They lead to the same thing and they're equally valid. All right, so last time I, I talked also about what's uh, we, not, we call the n coalescence. That is when you don't just have two lineages, but we have n lineages, you assemble n sequences. And what I was talking about last time is that then you get a tree. Uh, you don't just get a tree with two leaf nodes, you get a tree with many leaf nodes here. So in this case, there are four of them. Okay. And I talked a little bit about how that can be derived from this. Again, talk about competing exponentials, that you have all the different pairwise coalescence processes that are competing. So here's another way of, of, of thinking about it, of deriving that pro process. We can talk about what's the, if you look at, think back to the right Fisher model, what's the probability that none of the individuals share a common ancestor in the previous generation? That is, as you sample back in time and a parent, no two pairs will sample back the same parent. Well, it would be the probability that the two first individuals you're looking at, that they don't have the same parent. That would be this times the probability that the next individual, the third individual, doesn't choose any of the two previous parents that the other two individuals chose, and so on. Until all n individual in, the, in your sample, little n is the sample size, cattle n is the population size. So until you keep multiplying this together, until all individuals, you have accounted for all individuals in the population, all n individuals. And then if you multiply all these terms together, then you get what is on the right-hand side. There's a one. Uh, goes through in all terms. And then there are n choose two of these terms that also uh, 
uh, carry is an order one over two uh, n. And so you get one something that is one minus n choose two over two n. Okay, so that's n choose two of these terms. Uh, and then you get some higher order terms that are on the order of one over n squared. And the point here is that if we look at large, it's this coalescence approximation, this approximation for large population sizes. So as we let n become large, we get rid of these terms here. Okay. So we can say that to a, a, an approximation, a first order approximation, uh, the chance that nobody had the same parent in the previous generation is one minus n choose two divided by two n. And then we did what we did before. We set that to the power of r to see what happens in r generations, and then we let um, and then we look at the limit as n goes to infinity, and then a little bit of work will show that this then that's work that essentially falls out also of what J. F. C. Kingman originally who rigorously proved this uh, showed that you get an exponential distribu distribu uh, distribution where the parameter is n choose two on this coalescence scaling where we measure time in two n generations. So in general, the time in which that J ancestors in the sample is exponentially distributed will mean one divided by J choose two. Okay, so that's another argument uh, for why this uh, to sort of argue that how this process comes about. And again, uh, this was proved rigorously that this process arises by J F C King in 1980. Um, so we talked about last time. So what's the expected amount of time you spend? You have four lineages in the tree or three lineages in the tree, tree or two lineages and so on. So this is the tree I have here is a tree with, with four, four leaf nodes. Yeah, one, two, three, four. And uh, if you look at this first time interval here, there are four lineages in that time interval and the expected time uh, of that time interval then it's one divided by the rate of coalescence that time interval, so that becomes one six. The next time interval in which there are three lineages, the expected time is then one third by the same argument. And then finally here, we get back to the usual pairwise when there are two lineages left, the expected time is one. And again, these are all on this scaling where time is scaled in terms of two generations. So when I say one third, it means one third times two generations really. Okay, so a couple of many things that we learned from this is that the coalescence process is faster. The time you have to wait to a coalescence event. So this is the first coalescence event here, up here. The time you have to wait to that coalescence event is much shorter when there are many lineages than when there are fewer lineages. Okay, so you have short, these short branches in the tree up near the leaf nodes, the tip of the tree. And then you have these deep branches further down in the tree here, where you get these long coalescence times. All right. So a little bit, so I've used some words for trees now. I just want to make sure everybody on board with what those words means. The tips of the tree, we call them the leaf nodes. We talk about the edges or lineages of the tree. Those are the, the lines that connect the nodes in the tree. And we talk about external lineages. Those are the ones that lead to a leaf node or internal uh, lineages. Those are the ones that don't lead to a leaf node. And similar with nodes, we can talk about internal nodes. Those are the nodes that are not leaf nodes. We also talk about the most recent common ancestor, the MRCA of the tree that's down in the root of the tree. Okay, so let's think about mutations. How do mutations add, add into this on the tree? Well, again, we're going to use this infinite size model. So we're going to assume that every time you have a mutation, it generates a new variable size. So for example, look, consider this tree here, where you here to the, to the left, you have um, a mutation, for example, have on this lineage, lineage that, the lineage that leads to leaf node three, so sequence number three. Okay, so if that happened, this was the evolutionary history and there were no other mutations, you will have a, a site pattern, a pattern in your data where leaf nodes one, two, sequence one, two, four, five, and six, they wouldn't be of the mutant type, but leaf node three would be on the mutant type. So that's what you see in the first site here. So now we translate this into DNA sequences, we code them binary, just as if they have a mutation or they don't have a mutation. In real life is of course, A, C, T, or G. 
Uh, but for this, the purpose of this, we don't really care whether it was A or C or T or T. We just care that there are two different alleles and which one is the derived and which one is the ancestral one. So we get a pattern here where the third sequence has the derived type. Now we can take a, another mutation. For example, we can look at this mutation down here. Um, here we have a mutation that had an, in, the ans, in an ancestor of sequence one, two, and three. So that means that sequence one and two and three, they will carry that mutation, four, five, six won't. So that's the second side pattern you see here. You will have a one, one, one for, for sequence one, two, and three, indicating that they carry the mutation and a zero, zero, zero for four, five, and six because they didn't have the mutation. And again, it could be the pattern you would see in an alignment of DNA sequence might be AAA and CCC or something else. Um, and you could do this for the all mutations, for example, the mutation here that happens on the lineage leak into sequence four, five. So four, five is of type one and the other ones are of type zero. Okay, so there's a correspondence there by, between how mutations occur in the tree and then the DNA sequences. It's basically, that's what we're exploiting in most of the population genetic inferences. We assume this inference size model. So we knew, assume that there's this simple connection between tree and mutation on the tree and then the DNA sequences. And so we can now for the whole develop estimators of theta that use, that are, use this tree, inf or tree information in a different way. We already had this Tatima's estimator that used expected or average number of pairwise differences. But we can also use uh, estimators that do other calculations on the tree. For example, we could calculate the total tree length and figure out from that in total how many mutations would happen on the tree. And we did a little exercise with that last time where we were trying to add up all the length of the branches. So imagine you do that of a tree of size n. And you say on each branch, mutations happen at a rate theta divided by two. That will get you, get you, if you multiply those two together, that will get you the expected total number of mutations happening on the tree. We call that the total number of mutations, we call that the number of segregating sites. So number of segregating sites, we call that S. And we can show that that is equal to this by that argument about the total tree length multiplied by the rate of mutation. And we can then use that to estimate theta. So there's another estimate of theta that's called Watterson's estimator that takes advantage of that. That says, okay, let's, instead of looking at pairwise differences, let's count the total number of mutations and then get our estimate of theta based on the total number of mutations. And if you do that exercise, you basically take the expression up here and then you solve for theta. And then you get a method moments estimator of theta that's equal to this expression that you see below here. That's our estimator of theta based on the total number of segregating sites. So you'll calculate this quantity and that will be a guess at what the true value of theta is. All right. So let's go, we, we figured more about this, about how the mutations happen on the tree and which mutational patterns we get. Look at some DNA sequences. So here I'm doing some DNA sequences and we're gonna assume here just to make things simple that the first sequence also represent the ancestral state. Okay, in real life, you have to do something else to figure out what might be ancestral and what might be derived. For example, if you look at humans, you can look at what do you see in chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas that might inform you about what was ancestral in humans. Right now, we just, to make things easy, going to assume that the, what we see in the first sequence, that's ancestral. And then we can start counting what are the of different patterns in the data. For example, we have a mutation here in this position here where there's two of the ancestral type and three, or sorry, three of the ancestral type, AAA here, and two of the derived type, D and D. We have another pattern here where we have um, three of the derived type and two of the ancestral type. And we have a fourth one here where there's one of the uh, ancestral type and four of the derived type. And we can then plot them up. How many do we get of each of them? For example, here we have a mutation where we get four derived and one ancestral. We'll plot that here in this category of this allele frequency. And that will then in, be a proportion of one third uh, in, the, in the data. And if you do that, we can then do that for all of the data. And what can be shown and what we're not gonna show here, but what I'm just gonna tell you is that you can then derive what's called a site frequency spectrum. So that's a distribution of the allele frequencies in your cell. For this standard model, it's proportional to one over X. So the expectations here go one to a half, to a third, to a fourth, and so on, of how many copies, how many mutations, or the proportion of mutations you would expect with these different uh, allele frequencies of the derived allele. And these, these frequency spectra are very, very useful because they tell us a lot about the population. So I, I talked previously about that the model was wrong. 
uh, for these uh, comparing the Han and the African populations, and in particular the Han Chinese have experienced exponential population growth, and therefore the model doesn't quite fit. That's something you can see from this distribution of allele frequencies, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I'd like to stop now just to give you a, a chance to think more about these things uh, before we, we end on this uh, part of coalescence theory and then in, uh, answer a couple of different questions. And the questions are outlined here. Um, and uh, I think perhaps they're self-explanatory, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to see if I can upload these questions into the chat and then send you into breakout groups where you can discuss these questions together for about five minutes. So let's see if I can, I'm gonna stop sharing now and then gonna see if I can figure out to, uh, in the chat, uh, so let's see, I could see there's some questions I hadn't picked up on that. Maybe I'll try to answer them a little later. Um, let me see if I can put the question in the, in the chat, if it will accept that otherwise. Yeah, the questions are in the chat now, so you should be able to see the questions there. And then I'm gonna send you out into breakout rooms. Um, all right, creating the breakout rooms now. See you later. Okay, uh, hopefully everybody back now. Um, so uh, I hope uh, somebody contacted me and said that they couldn't really see the questions. Uh, I hope I'm not quite sure why it wasn't really uh, viewable uh, from the chat. Um, maybe Vladimir can look into that. Uh, Vladimir, did you get? Can you see the questions in the chat? Uh... No, no. I think uh, when we go to the breakout rooms, we have a different chat. Uh, my ah. suggestion is, so now you can find uh, a link to the YouTube live stream and then you can rewind and uh, see all the slides. Okay. Is right. the easiest way to follow. Okay. Otherwise, I've, in the next breakout room, I will, um, if you still don't have the question, I'll just leave the, the, the questions up. Uh, here, so you have to go in and out to be able to see mm -hmm. the questions. In any ways, did, did any of you have time to look at these questions? Maybe the first one, the second one is a bit harder. The first one is perhaps a bit easier. Um, anybody wants to speak up? Or should I choose somebody randomly? All right, let's take um, breakup room five. Uh, the people that were supposed to be in that breakup room at least was Anastasia Tokariva, Beatrice, Dimitri Glizen, and Kennenbeck R. Okay, hello. Uh, we figure out uh, that it should be, the answer should be three to the question. Uh, well, we uh, try to Think in the following way: We, we can uh, have mu from the, the first equation, mm -hmm. right? So, so we know uh, how many uh, mutations occur in each generation. That is mm -hmm. one over two n. Mm -hmm. And then, as we have six n generation total, we just multiply uh, the number of generations by the rate. So we have yes. three. Yes, that's good. That's right. That's exactly it. Good. Did you make any headway on the second one? Oh, uh, well. Do you have time for that? Yeah, yes, I, I suppose it is uh, four over nine here. Um, yeah, so let, let's let's talk about that question for, for, a, little, for a little bit. Um, maybe I'll just uh, go, go through that question. Mm. So, so, well. Um, hmm? We have to imagine that we have a tree like this. Let's see if you can see what I'm drawing right now. You cannot see what I'm drawing. Oh, mm -hmm. you could, you could see what I'm drawing. Um, so we assume that we have a tree like this. And then we have uh, asked, trying to answer the question, what's the chance that a new mutation uh, that arises is uh, a, in a single copy? Now, if the new mutation that arises in, in a single copy, that would be that because it happens on this lineage here. Okay. The total tree length that we have, we know is three. 
So we take the length of that lineage divided by the total tree length. Length of that lineage is one plus one third. So that's four third. So the total answer is four ninth. And I think that's what you said as well, right? Mm -hmm. I think they were absolutely right about yeah. that. So that's that's a calculation that we can do to, to where we can predict mm -hmm. what's the expected proportion of mutations in each particular category. Um, and that's essentially the type of calculation that get, can get a little bit more complicated than that, of course, but it's the same logic that allows us to, to calculate for the entire frequency spectrum for all possible categories, what's the expected number of mutations. And lots of what people Excuse are doing me. is that they're trying to do that uh, for different models to get expectations for different models uh, and then try to fit that to data. And we'll be talking a little bit about that later. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about how different processes might affect the coalescence tree. Because now we know that predicting distributions of mutations, what frequencies that will have in the data, that depends on the structure of the coalescence tree. So if we know the structure of the coalescence tree, then we can predict the distribution of mutations of allele frequencies in the data. And I'm just gonna not go through too much math with this, but just give you a little bit of intuition. So if you look to, at the tree to the left, that might be a tree from that standard coalescence process we've been considering so far, um, where we can see these deep branches here, they tend to be relatively long. Now, if you have changes in the population size, that will change the relative length of the different branches. And the way to think about it is that we know the rate of correlations depend on the population size. So when the population size is small, you coalesce at a fast rate. That means branches will be short. When the population sizes are large, it takes a long time to coalesce. And then branches in those time intervals will be shorter. So let's say, for example, we have an increasing population size. That means back in time, Populations had a small size. That means that you don't get these deep branches as we normally do in the constant population size. We tend, in average, to get branches in the deep part of the tree when there are few lineages left that are much shorter. So we might get something like this, where the length of these external branches are much larger compared to these internal branches. Okay, and that will change the distribution of allele frequencies uh, in the data. For example, we might get many more singletons. That is mutations that exist in a single copy because these external lineages here, they will be relatively larger compared to the internal lineages. Decreasing population sizes, we have the opposite argument. With decreasing population size, that means that the population size was larger in the past. That means it took longer time to coalesce in the past. And now today, it's not coalescence occur much faster. So we might get a tree like this, where near the leaf nodes here, in this part of the tree, the branches, the edges are relatively short, but in the deeper part of the tree towards the root, when there are few lineages left, branches are much longer. And you can see that this will induce also a different set of patterns. For example, here with data like this, the way I've drawn this tree, you might get a bimodal distribution of pairwise differences, for example. Most of the mutation will follow on, fall on these two branches. And if you look at the site frequency spectrum, you will get a distribution where you get many mutations that are relatively high frequency because any mutation that happens on all of these two long branches here, they will have a lot of descendants. So you don't get so many singletons, you don't get so many mutations of small frequency, but you get many more mutations of high frequency. And that's the kind of pattern that we can be looking for when we, for example, we make inferences about has there been a change in the population size? We can look at this distribution of mutations and we can link that to population size through the collision theory. That is when we see a particular pattern of allele frequencies, what might that tell us about the history of the population is through considerations of these coalescence trees that we can learn about that. Okay, so here's an example. What you have here is uh, an African uh, site frequency spectrum from some African population from one of the first SNP data sets. So remember SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms that the, uh, different positions in the genome that are variable. And this is one of the first data sets generated, uh, the Seattle SNP data set, it was called back then, you know, more than 15 years ago. And what we have here is uh, uh, a frequency, a site frequency spectrum, that is a distribution of allele frequencies, where we can see that if you look, um, if you look at the open columns, the open bars, these ones here, that's the real data. And if you see these ones here, that with this mesh, those are the ones from uh, that you would expect under the standard neutral model, okay, under the model of constant population size. 
So if you think about population size changes, what might this tell you about population sizes? Well, you have too many singletons in the real data compared to the, the theoretical model of a constant population size. So what this tells you is that there's, in fact, uh, there's like, likely to have been some kind of population growth, for example. That will generate this pattern where the external lineages, the external edges are relatively longer relative to the internal one. So you get more of these uh, singletons of mutations that segregate at a low frequency in the population. And what this will also show is that people have been fitting a model to that. Here, yeah, that's called the maximum. That's the one that the best fitting model that you could fit to uh, the real data. And from that, they estimated a population growth rate for these populations based on that. All right. Okay, so we talked a little bit now on changes in population size. Um, we are going to change gear a little bit now and talk about the coalescence with migration. Um, and I think I prepared to do sort of a mathematical derivation of that. I think we're going to, in the sake of time, skip that today and then just talk about it more, generate some intuition about this process. So what we're gonna assume now is that there's not one population just, but that there are two populations. So in this particular, Case here, you can see we have the two ovals representing the two populations, and we assume there's much some migration between the populations. That means that in every generation, we assume in a right Fisher model that you sample from the other population, a parent will, if you look at one population, you sample from the other population with probability M, the migration rate, and you sample a parent from your own population with probability one minus M. So M is the migration rate and is the probability that your parent in a previous generation was from another population. Okay, so that's how we interpret the migration rate in, in population genetics and, and, and what that means. So now we can start thinking about population level processes. And so we can think about, uh, or think about how they evolve in time. So think about a right Fisher model where you now have two populations, they're evolving forward in time. And in each generation, it's a right Fisher model within each of the two populations. And the only difference now is that there's some probability M that you will sample your parent from the other population. All right. So this is a realization of a process like this. And what you can see is that most of the time, if you track lineages back in the tree, you sample from the same population. So M is not very large. But at some point in time, for example, if you take this red lineage here and go back in time, three generations in the past, there was an individual who has had his ancestor from another population. Okay, so that was a migration event. Um, so we can track lineages in this way back in time until they migrate or until they find most recent common ancestors if we have more than one. So we can go to two individuals now. Now with the red individuals we have sampled from population two. And now we trace their ancestry back in time. And we can see here again at generation three, this one was a migrant. Now these two can't coalesce anymore, they're in different populations. They can only coalesce if one of them migrates. So you have to wait until one of them, looking backwards this time, migrates, and then there's a possibility of coalescence. In this case, it happened immediately, but it could take some time before uh, that coalescence happened. So now we can construct a new coalescence process. And in that coalescence process, we can calculate expected coalescence times and distribution of coalescence times, similarly to what we did for one population. Um, the math gets a bit harder because you have to sum over all these possible ways that people could have migrated back and forth. But there are many things we can calculate quite easily, such as pairwise expected coalescence times. They're easy to calculate still. We can easily set up some equations. If I had more time, I would do that for you. That uh, uh, derives what is the expected time to coalescence in a model like this with, uh, with migration. Now, what I really want to get at is and talk more about uh, is uh, how you, what you measure from the data, okay? And, the, and how you in the use the data to infer, <coughs> excuse me, population differences. And the most common thing that is being used in most studies, the oldest thing certainly is to calculate what's called FST. FST measures genetic population di uh, differentiation. It measures if the two populations are how uh, different their allele frequencies are uh, between two or more populations. And here we're just going to consider two populations, but it can be generalized to more than two populations. 
And I'm going to spend a little bit of time and talking about FST is because it's sort of very classical standard thing to do in population genetics. And I think there's some intuition to get from many different things from looking at, uh, at FST. All right. So uh, you, you see in this slide here, FST is a function of these two, uh, these two functions, HT and HS. So let me explain what those are. Okay. These are, are the heterozygosities you get in each in the local populations compared to the total heterozygosity you would get that's HT if you treated the whole, the two populations as one big merged population. So HS here is the heterozygosity in the subpopulations. Remember what the heterozygosity is, the expected heterozygosity. We get that by looking at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium expectations. So the expected heterozygosity are previously defined as being two times the allele frequency times one minus the allele frequency, if you only have two alleles. So that's from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium expectations. So this term here, the first term here, that is the, um, the expected heterozygosity in the first population. So the subscript here, A1, that is this a frequency of allele A in population one. Okay, so this whole thing is the expected heterozygosity in the first population. Or here you have the expected heterozygosity in the second population. Same thing, two times the frequency of the allele times one minus the frequency of the allele. And then we take the average of the two. There are other ways of doing this. But in this case, we're just going to make it simple. Let's take the average of the two. Okay. And that is then the average expected heterozygosity in the subpopulations. And you see, you can see the twos cancel out. So it, it simplifies to this expression here on the right. Now, what we also want to calculate is what is the exp expected heterozygosity if we just pool everybody together as if it was just one population. We ignore that there's population subdivision, that there's population structure. We ignore that there really are two populations. And we're going to pool everybody together as if there only was one population. Now, what's then the allele frequency in this pooled population? Well, we're going to, again, as to make things simple, assume that we sample equally from the two populations. Then the allele frequency is FA1 plus FA2 divided by two. It's the average of the allele frequency in the two populations. And then we simply take that and plug into the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium formula. formula. Then we get two times the allele frequency times one minus the allele frequency. That's the expected heterozygosity in this pooled population. Okay, so now that's the definition of HT and HS. And then we want to, we can calculate FST based on that. Um, remember, this is the definition of FST. It's HT minus SH divided by HT. When we do that, we can do a little bit of simplification to learn something uh, a little bit more about how FST behaves. Let's first define this D here down the right-hand corner as being the difference in a little frequency between the two uh, populations. Then we can do a little bit of, of simplification of its HT. And after a little bit of algebra, high school algebra, we can show that HT can be written in this form down here. Okay. If we use uh, that definition of D. So what you can see here, HT here is equal to HS plus this term D squared over two. Okay. And that should give us some intuition about what's really is going on here. So I want you to go back now in the breakout rooms. I'm gonna leave this slide up in, uh, as you are in the ba ba breakout rooms and see if you can discuss these two questions. So what does it tell us about the effect of population subdivision? And that's here to find the differences in allele frequency populations on FST. So how does differences in allele frequencies translate into values of FST? And what is the maximum and minimum value of FST? And when would we, uh, uh, when would those values uh, be observed? So I'd like to, to spend like three, four minutes just discussing that briefly, just to help maybe for yourself to build up some intuition about FST. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, send you out in breakout rooms. Uh, now, please uh, join the breakout rooms. All right. Um, welcome back. So let's um, let's hear from some. Right, last time we took uh, breakup room five. Let's take another uh, breakup room now. Maybe we'll take breakup room one, for example, and see if 
you have any suggestions for answers to this. That group had Daniel Shiskin, Galina Vlasenko, Natalia Sanova, Nikita Ganyanov, and then Ross Corbett was also was supposed to be in, in that group. Um, and uh, sorry, by the way, about the foul pronunciation of your names. Uh, do anybody in that group, do you, any of, anybody have any suggestions here? We'll break up room one. No? Can you hear me out there? I think they are too shy. Okay, they're too shy. Well, that's okay. That's fine. We'll take another breakup room. This is, uh, it's, it's okay. Let's take breakup room, take breakup room um, two then. Irina Tsipina, Lydia uh, Desietkina, sorry about the pronunciation. Polina Cheripanova, Sirakin Dimitri, and Senia Sakvastina. Sorry, the kid is sleeping, so I can't answer it by voice. All right. Um, anybody else want to speak up from that group? So, uh... We didn't really discuss the answers, but I thought of the answer to the second question. And I think the maximum value of FST is uh, one divided by two, like the half. What, and what do you think, what do you think the minimum value is? Uh, zero. Um, zero. That's that's correct. So um, so FST. So when FST is uh, when D is equal to zero, HT and HS uh, are identical to each other, and then FST is also uh, equal to to zero. Um, when um, uh, FST is when D is equal to one, it turns out. FST is equal to one. It goes between zero and one. Um, and uh, when it's one is in the case where there's complete difference in allele frequencies. So for example, if A1 uh, is equal to one and if A2 is equal to zero, in that case, you will get that then FST is equal to one. So FST goes between zero and one. And so, uh, Another thing we can see from this is that HT is always larger than HS, right? That's sort of the same thing as saying that the minimum is zero. And this, and that goes to question one, which is what does this really tell us about difference in, in little frequency? Well, you can think of HS, that's the actual heterozygosity you see out in the populations. Whereas HT is the one you would expect if there wasn't any subdivision. There was it was just one panmictic population. Okay, so the fact that we know that HT is also always larger than HS means that we all we can we know that uh, the observed heterozygosity is always lower than the expect that the heterozygosity that you would find if there was no population subdivision. So an, another way of saying that is that population subdivision differences in allele frequencies between population always decreases the heterozygosity and increases the homozygosity compared to what you would expect under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So what you would expect that is HT. Okay, so that's one of the things that we see again and again in population genetics. We see when we look at real data, there often is more, more homozygosity than what you expect on the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium expectations don't, don't hold. And the number one reason for that is this. It's because really when you think you have sent for an unknown population, this really is some population structure. There are some differences in allele frequency. And by what's called the wall, uh, the wall on principle, which is basically what we have shown here, uh, we know that if there is population structure, it will increase the homozygosity. It's the most likely explanation for those patterns we see over and over again uh, out in nature. Okay, so FST measures differences in allele frequency. When the difference in allele frequency is large, FST becomes large. 
When the difference in allele frequency between the population is small, and they're very similar to each other genetically, they have similar allele frequencies, FST becomes close to zero. That's the major thing to, to remember about this. And so people use this all the time and has been doing that for decades. What you go out with your genetic data, you calculate FST and between different populations, and then you try to understand what does that tell you about the relationship between populations. And what you often do is that if you plot distances between populations in geographic distances on the x-axis, and then this genetic distance, the FST on the y-axis, you'll find that they're highly correlated. That is that genetics mirrors geography. You see that in many, many different species, and you certainly see that in humans. This is for humans. See that human populations that are close together, they're genetically similar, they have no values of FST, and populations that are very distant from each other geographically, they have high values of, of FST. So we can understand that in terms of migration, for example. We can understand that in terms of the time it takes to coalesce for two populations that are separated by many, by many migration step in a big network of migrating populations. We can also see it as a, as a, as a consequence of the historical splits that occur in, for example, humans. So we know humans originate in Africa about maybe 100,000 years ago. Uh, probably more recently, for, uh, for most of the ancestry in humans, humans migrated out of Africa. Uh, and then split into different parts of the world. And that process of population splitting up from each other can sometimes also make a similar pattern. All right, so here is another example, moose, moose in Canada, Alaska actually, Alaskan moose. Here's from some paper here that calculate FST values between all the moose from different populations. So they have multiple different populations here, Yakutat, Tanana Flats, Seward Peninsula, and so on. They calculate FST between them. And then from that, they're trying to make inferences about how do they migrate between them. Okay, how well connected are these populations? If they migrate a lot between them, FST is high. And how do you connect FST to rates of migration? Well, you can do that through the coalescence models. So you can calculate what the expected FST value is. It's in fact not very hard between a pair of population uh, given the migration rate by looking at the expected coalescence times. That's these heterozygosities can be derived from coalescence times, and FST is a function of the heterozygosities. So when you know coalescence times, you know expected values of FST. And people are using that then to make inferences about connectivity between populations, for example, of, of the Alaskan moose in this particular case. Now I talked about that, that um, you could also, for, for example, for humans, think of models of population structure not just this model of migration, but also of population splitting. So let's assume now that there's no, to make things simple, assume that there's no migration, but in, as, instead entertain models where populations split up from each other. So that's illustrated in this figure here. So we have now a capital T. That's the time at which the population split up from each other. And then we have a lowercase t. That's the coalescence time. Okay. And what you, we can do now is we can, for example, consider assembling a, a gene copy or an allele, DNA sequence, an individual from one population and from the other population. And then look back in time to see if we can figure out when the first coalesced. Okay. And that is relatively easy to write down equations for that. It's in fact easier than an migration model and, and, and we can do that. An important point of that is that in a model like this, of course, this coalescence time would always be larger than this, the divergence time or the split time between the populations, because the two lineages here, they can't coalesce together if they're in different populations. And with no migration, they're bound to stay in different populations. Of course, until the time at which, in backwards in time, the two populations merge. And then you have a coalescence process, like just the single population process. So now you have to wait an additional time until the two lineages coalesce. It's very important for many different things, this process. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But think about it like this, that what we often do is that we take DNA sequences and then we estimate the divergence time between the sequences. We estimate how long time since they had a most recent common ancestor. That's what's done in phylogenetics. When people estimate evolutionary trees, that's what they do. But what this tells us is that those times we estimate from that do not reflect actually this divergence time between the populations. They reflect this older coalescence time. Mostly biologically, what we're really interested in are these divergence times between the population. When they split up, we imagine you know, that two populations of some lizard or something 
and then suddenly a river emerges and split up the two populations. We don't want to know what when that happened. Or for example, when did people move out of Africa? When did that happen? And if we just take two sequences and estimate the divergence between them, what we'll get is this coalescence time, not the divergence time. It might sound when explained like this, perhaps obvious, but it actually has misled many, many, many studies that these two things have been conflated with each other, that people thought they were the same thing, and they're clearly not. All right. We can also look if we have more than two individuals, we can make get coalescence trees uh, from that. So in this particular cartoon here, I have four individuals, two from population one and two from population two, and we can track their ancestry back in time. So you can see, for example, uh, in this particular case, the two individuals in population one, they have a common ancestor down here that corresponds to this node in the tree. And these two individuals, they have a common ancestor down here that corresponds to that node in the tree. Then the population merge here, looking forward in time they split, looking backwards in time they merge. And then the coalescence process start, uh, continues in an ancestral population until an ancestor is found down here, corresponding to that node in the tree. You can see here, in this particular case, there's full compatibility between the population tree that we get and then the coalescence trees. So the two individuals for population one, they have a coalescence time more recent with each other than either have them with population two. The two individuals from population two, they have a most recent common ancestor down here that they share, that's not shared with population one. So we talk about, in that case, what's called reciprocal monophyly, that individuals here, they all form a, what's in, in phylogenetics called a monophyletic group. They all share a most recent common ancestor that's not shared with other individuals. And the same thing is true from population one. They are recipro reciprocally monophyletic. This reciprocal monophyly, the, the population tree here and the coalescence tree tell the same story. That's one way to think about it. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen. So for here we have another case. Again, we have sampled two individuals from population one and two populations from population two. We go back in time and what happens is that these two individuals from population one, they didn't have a most recent common ancestor, just randomly that didn't happen before the time at which the population split. So when we go back to that time, they actually free lineages and it happens then back at that time that an individual from that originated from population one then has a has a, a common ancestor with these two individuals from population two. So we get a tree like the one we see to the right, where one of the individuals from population two, one groups together with population two. This individual share a most recent common ancestor down here with these two individuals. And that's not shared with that individual. That's what's called incomplete lineage sorting. It's an old concept going back to, actually, I think perhaps mentioned first in the, in the late 70s, perhaps early 80s, before people had really any data, but people are aware that this might happen, that you could get in some sense a tree that's wrong, it doesn't reflect the history of the populations because of this coalescence process that happens uh, in the ancestor. Okay, so the idea here is that the lineages in the tree are not sorted out completely into the different populations. That's why they call it incomplete lineage sorting. So what that can result in is, of course, that if you estimate species tree in phylogenetics, you end up getting wrong trees. So here's a case where in the reds, you have a species tree that's compatible, or a coalescence tree that's compatible with species tree. So you see here species two and three here, they are sister species. These splits here, there's a speciation time, divergence time between the populations where they split up from each other. We track here a coalescence tree within that, as we've been doing before. And in red, we see here a coalescence tree, where in this ancestral population of two and three, there's a coalescence between the lineage from species two and lineage from species three, species three. So we get a coalescence tree here that mimics the species tree. But we, it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, if these two lineages didn't find a common ancestor here, but they persisted through this time interval, then back here, there would be three lineages and we could get a different tree. And that's what's going on in blue. Here, the gene tree, the coalescence tree that we get has a coalescence between species one and species two first down here before that lineage coalesces with species three. So the, if we just had that gene to look at and no other data, and if we assume that this gene tree that we're estimating reflects the species tree, we would be led 
to wrong conclusion because of this concept of incomplete linen sorting. We can end up getting the wrong tree uh, in some parts of the genome. And in some sense, it's not wrong. It's just one shouldn't true that one particular tree from one particular gene necessarily reflects the history of the species because coalescence times is something different than divergence times. So we can look, people looked at that in many different cases. Probably the most famous is to look at human, chimp, and gorilla. This was a huge question before you had genomic data. Is humans more related to chimp or to gorillas? Or in fact, chimp and gorilla more closely related to each other than they are to humans? We now know that this is the correct tree for the relationship between human, chimps, and gorillas. Human and chimps are more closely related to each other. They share most more recent common ancestor than humans do with gorilla or chimps do with gorilla. But there was considerable debate about that. And the first genetic data didn't really necessarily resolve the question because sometimes you've got a tree that looks like this, but sometimes you've got some other trees because of this problem of incomplete linear sorting. So in red, again, you have the tree where the, the coalescence tree reflect the true species tree. And that happens because there was a coalescence here in this internal branch of the species tree. But that may not necessarily happen. It could be that no coalescence happened there and you get, you get the wrong tree as here in green, where gorillas and chimps are more closely related to each other. So there was a lot of controversy about this pretty much until we got genomic data and we could really see what was going on. When we got full genomic data, we could, oops, we could um, resolve the issue by having many, many data sets to look at. And here it might be important in connection to that to remind you of the process of recombination. So why do you have the same tree for the entire genome? Well, that's because as you produce uh, germ cells, so sperm cells and egg cells that you, as you transmit your genes to the next generation, you only transmit one copy of the DNA, of course. You transmit either some DNA from your father or from your mother. That DNA is organized on chromosomes like this. So you can, for example, imagine that the blue here, that's the DNA from your mother. The red is in the DNA from the father. As you transmit the DNA to the next generation, a re recombination might happen. That is that some DNA from your father's chromosome might be put on the mother's chromosome and vice versa. So you might make new recombinant chromosomes like this after recombination. So that breaks up correlations in the genome. And that means that in the genome, you'll get millions of different trees. Not all segments of the genome has the same tree. They in fact, I tend to have different trees because the correlation is broken up through time by recombination. So you could ask, going back to the question about human chimps and gorillas, how often in, the, in the, the, the genome do you see the right tree, what we think is the right tree where human and chimps are most closely related to each other, and how often do you see the other tree? And that's illustrated in this figure. This is chromosome one and chromosome two. And every place in the genome where there's red here, you get the right tree, human and chimps, they group together, and then gorillas is the outgroup or the more distant related species relative to these two. In blue and green are placed in the genome where you get the two other trees. And you get it sort of uh, roughly 70% of the genome, you get the right one, and 15% you get each of the wrong one, relative symmetrically, which you would expect uh, under the coalescence process. So when people couldn't really resolve the issue in the beginning, it's because they only had very few genes. And then they saw some of the blue one and some of the green ones here. But now we know that the majority is red, and that's compatible with the hypothesis that human and chips, in fact, are sister groups and that gorilla is an outgroup to uh, humans and chips. Okay, so that was incomplete linear sorting and how we use this to look at things in a very distant time scale. Uh, at a more recent time scale, of course, this is used, uh, genetic data is used to look at, at, at human patterns of migration, for example. So how humans have split, uh, spread out uh, in the world. And there are many, 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 of course, interesting processes going on, uh, on there. And right these days, particularly the last 10 years, we learned a tremendous amount of information about human history from starting the patterns of genomic variation, both in modern data and in ancient data. Ancient data, that is when you have some old bones, you can extract DNA from that and maybe sequence the genome also of these old bones. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about that. Um, but first, I, I think I'd like you to now think a little bit about the relationship again between these population level processes and um, trees. So I'm gonna make another breakout group here for just a few minutes. And what I'd like you to do is to consider this tree here. So let me just explain to you what you're seeing here. 
these are different individuals where we have gotten that genome for these different individuals. A particular point, a particular part of the genome, we've then estimated a tree. So this is an estimated tree from the DNA sequences that we've estimated. Okay, so it reflects a coalescence tree. And what we have here is then um, different uh, po human populations. Blue are Africans, red, that's Asians, yellow, that's uh, people from Australia or New Guinea, and um, purple down here, those are Europeans. So I'd like you to look at that tree and then say just informally, non-mathematically, what does a tree like this tell you us about human history? What you, how would you interpret a tree like this? And the reason why I ask that is that the field of population genetics spent 40 years looking at tree like this, or 30 years, and doing that kind of interpretation. And I'd like you to sort of go through the exercise of how would you interpret a tree like this? What does this tree tell us about human history? All right, so I'm going to send you out in, a, in breakout groups for about five, six, seven minutes. Please join the breakout groups. All right, welcome back. Um, so anybody that wants to uh, share their thoughts about this? Tell us a little bit about what you discussed in the breakout rooms. Uh, I can. Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, this tree is built up on based on uh, mitochondria haplogroups because of this RCRS uh, branch. Oop, I can't hear you now. Can you? Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this tree is based on, I think this tree is based on mitochondria haplogroups because of this RCRS uh, branch. Uh, and uh, it is in, in a European cluster. And uh, the root here is in Africa. And we see that in Africa, uh, uh, mitochondrial haplogroups were split uh, pretty much uh, slowly. So uh, it could be like uh, dozen, dozens of thousand years between splits in Africa. And then afterwards in Europe and uh, basically in Eurasia, uh, uh, the, those splits uh, has become much faster, like thousands or hundreds of years uh, between between uh, uh, branches. So um, yeah, that's what we can say uh, from this tree. If you look at this tree. Okay. Anybody else that wants to share something what you discussed in your groups? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in my group, there was a wonderful proposition that based on this tree, we can conclude that Europe and Asia are on the same continent. <laughs> <laughs> because they, you know, you know, they are all mixed up. And that was a really good conclusion. And actually, we can observe some uh, geographical data from this tree. Yeah, you, we can see uh, the, how did the continents split up from each other? And that is basically the time when we separate, uh, for example, Australians from Eurasians and both Australians and Eurasians from Americans. Yeah. So in our group, there was a bit of more geographical point of view. Yeah, and based on clusters, you can uh, infer <coughs> how, uh, you know, uh, how the groups, uh, how populations were moving across the time. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, even though we, we see that the cost, some clusters are uh, comprised of populations uh, uh, from different parts of the world. And we can uh, propose that probably uh, uh, those populations uh, like were uh, together and at some point part of this population migrated to another part of the world and then uh, they had uh, you know uh, different uh, genetic structure afterwards good yeah so as you can see there's um, a lot of things that you could 
potential tilt from a, a, a tree like this. So the, the traditional story when people first started to estimate trees like this was that uh, the root of the tree is in Africa. So this is basically the evidence that was used basically based on a tree like this, an mtDNA tree, one of the, the first one. And that came out is that humans originated in Africa and parts become uh, from that. You will see that the clade, the group of all other individuals cluster within the African group. So in some sense, we're all Africans. It's just, it's for some of us, it's long time since we've been home in Africa, so to speak, that this subgroup of human diversity here, you find that outside Africa, but they even know some Africans with some related uh, sequence. So it's complicated. And then there's this thing about, you do get sort of a tendency perhaps that people from New Guinea, the cluster together and Europeans, but not quite, right? And so we had the answer about, well, people on the same subcontinent, but what does it really tell us about how the relationship between these populations? And people have been much more bold than you were here in trying to come up with explanations, just looking at a tree like this, for how people have moved around in the world and trying to explain that. And in many opinions, too bold. And the, well, if you spend a lot, lot of, enough time on this exercise and sitting, staring at that tree, eventually you should come to this conclusion that maybe there are many different possible stories that could be told. And we really need some more rigorous ways to think about population genetics than just making a tree and telling a story. Then it's not quite a lot, not enough, because it's unclear exactly which story the tree is telling. Uh, and to get to that, that's where coalescence theory again comes in, to interpret that tree, to relate this to be specific models about how people move around in the world. Uh, that's what, in some sense, the raison d'etre of, uh, of population genetics, that it can be used to really understand in a more formal sense what information you get from, from these kind of trees. So much work has been done over the past 20 years on trying to take population data and then make formalized methods for inference of history. And some of the most successful methods, they just look at the site frequency spectrum. They say, okay, we don't have one tree like we had here. We really have hundreds of thousands of trees and that's complicated. Modern methods on the development right now really try to look at the trees, but historically that's been considered intractable. Instead, let's just look at the site frequency spectrum, the distribution of allele frequencies. So here's an example of a site frequency spectrum jointly for two populations. On the y-axis, you have Han Chinese, and on the x-axis, you have people that are from Tibet. So they are genetically related to the Han Chinese, but they are also differentiated from them. And what it shows are the allele frequencies. So SNPs you found down in this corner here, down to the left, those are SNPs at low frequency, both among the Han Chinese and Tibetans. Up here, those are SNPs of high frequency among Han and Tibetans. SNPs here are SNPs where the divided allele has a high frequency in the Han, but low in Tibetans and so on. And the color coding in this heat map tells you how many SNPs are there of these different kinds. So looking at that, immediately you can see allele frequencies in these two populations are highly correlated with each other, obviously. They're not very genetically differentiated from each other. They're very similar. But what more can, can it tell us? Well, you have to fit some, some models to it. And then you can use your coalescence model. And these predictions about the site frequency spectrum we talked about before, by looking at where mutations happen on the tree, you can predict, at least by simulation, sometimes using other methods, how many mutations you would expect of each kind. And so now you have an expectation of how a site frequency spectrum, in this case, a two-dimensional site frequency spectrum should look, you have it observed, and you can fit them together. And that's what many common and popular programs for making inferences in population genetics, they take advantage of. I'm just gonna go give one analysis. This is because this is some work I did, I think the, I, some work I did myself, I think it's the first time something this, like this was ever done before we had really, you know, as good programs for it as we have today. There's some data from 20 European Americans and 19 African Americans. And we basically estimated using the site frequency spectrum models of the European American, African American, they, their history, putting in things like population growth, bottlenecks and migration and admixture. Of course, particularly African Americans are typically admixed between people of European ancestry and people of African ancestry, typically predominantly African ancestry, but not even that always. So African Americans are really only partially uh, of original African ancestry. So modeling that mixture is also important. So then you can make a coalescence model that have all of these ingredients and you can, uh, you can predict what the site frequency should look. And then you can fit a model 
this model that predicts the site frequency spectrum, you can fit that to the observed data, the observed site frequency spectra, to estimate these parameters. And so you're going to get estimates from that. So here in this particular case, we estimate the divergence time between people from Africa and Europe was 75,000 years. So the coalescence time, if you look at that, might be 300, 400,000 years. It's much cheaper. But our estimate of when the populations actually diverge is something more like uh, 75,000 years. And then strong population growth since then, and quite a lot of migration, and also the mixture. And then you can look at, at the frequency spectra. So here you have the frequency spectrum, the distribution of allele frequencies in, in the observed data in red and simulated in, in blue. And you can see they fit very well. You can find a model at least that fits the data well. well. And the same thing for the European Americans. So you can generate these models that predict the data. And from that, you can estimate parameters. And then all the usual things in when you do these kind of things arise, how to get confidence intervals. Uh, and there are ways we do that where we bootstrap data in the genome in blocks. Uh, that's one way of doing it, for example. And of course, also um, how well can we trust these models? And could there maybe be other models that fit just as well? And that's always an ongoing discussion, an important thing that lots of research is going on in how to best explore the space of possible model. How do we find the best models to fit the data when you, for example, want to estimate these divergence times and growth rates and, and so on. Anyway, so these have good goodness of fit. You uh, can't really predict uh, uh, the model after fitting uh, five, six parameters to the data. All right, so today, now people have uh, more sophisticated programs than what we used back then, and they sometimes fit very complicated models to this. So here's from one paper where they try to fit a model of human history using a bunch of different sequences, Europeans, East Asians, people from New Guinea, Australia, Southwestern Australia, particularly uh, to look at the history of people from Australia. And you see that many different parameters are being fit to the data in order to try to, to do that. Uh, and um, this sort of still more or less state of the art of how many inferences are done population genetics. The most commonly used tool right now is to use these distribution of allele frequencies in different populations and then and their joint frequencies and then try to fit these kind of models to it. For complicated models like this, it's very hard to do the calculation of the expected site frequency spectrum. You can do that, approximate that using numerical methods or often various simulation methods are used and there are different approaches for this. Um, some approaches approximates the forward process, the right Fisher process directly using diffusion equations. So using a setup of some partial differential equations that explain the change in the little frequency and solve those. Most people use uh, coalescence uh, framework and that's what's also is, is, is used here. Okay, so that's a little bit about how inferences is done in population genetics these days. Uh, the most common methods on how to make inferences about the history of population. I'll end, spend the last do we have 10 minutes talking about some other methods that are very, very common in, uh, in population genetics. These are more, the occasion when you have genomic data, and then you're interested in, in some sense, some simpler questions that are easier to answer. Uh, when you're not trying to reconstruct the history of the populations, estimate the history of the populations, but answer questions such as, to which population does an individual belong? So you have an individual, where does that individual come from? Uh, and how many, in, you know, how, how can we group human diversity, how can we group humans into different groupings if you want to do that and define groupings. Uh, and use that as a way to more and then more explore, to, you know, as a more explorative tool for trying to understand distribution of genetic variation. And you might have seen um, plots like this, structure plots. This is for one of the famous paper by Noah Rosenberg and his colleagues from 2002, where they do this type of analysis. And let me just give you to explain briefly what is done in this type uh, of analysis, and then afterwards, what the plot shows. So you make a very simple model where you assume that each individual has a fractional membership of different populations. Maybe there are two populations, or three populations, or four populations. And each individual is not just from a population, but it might be 80% from one population and 20% from another population. So our parameters that are unknown here is first, the fractional membership of each individual to each population. All right. The other thing you, you, you're trying to estimate is then what's the allele frequency in these different hypothetical populations. Okay. So you estimate that jointly with these fractional members, uh, fractional uh, memberships of different populations. And that's mathematically quite simple model where you uh, can calculate the 
chance of sampling a certain allele for an individual by simply summing over the chance of sampling from the different populations, weighting by the allele frequency and the fractional membership of the individual of that population. So it's a little sum over the different populations of the allele frequencies weighted by these fractional memberships. And then you either do MCMC to integrate over possibilities or you optimize that. You can write down a likelihood function for all the data by taking the product of all individuals and the product over all the loci you have, all the, all the data, just multiply it all together. That gives you an objective function you can maximize. And from that, you'll get estimates like these ones here. And what do this show? Well, each little column here is an individual and they're structured in different populations. You can see there's some there that are, Afri are African origin, some that's of European or origin, East Asian and so on. And then the coloration tells you the fractional membership of each individual to these different hypothetical population. So this particular plot has, usually you would get many more African populations, but there's very poor representation of Africans here. So they just, even though very different from each other, more different than other people, they somehow just get grouped into one population here, the Africans. And that's in, in what you see, if we, for example, go for Kegel free, that's if you assume they're free populations, then one of them is this one representing Africans. The blue one um, is then Europe and South Asia, Asia mostly. And then the purple one is East Asia. And then for each individual, you can then infer what's a fraction of membership of each population. So this is sort of an extraction where you say we enforce that there has to be these uh, uh, discrete populations. And if there are discrete populations, how can we then best model individuals as a function of these discrete populations? It's been a very, very popular tool for visualizing variation, uh, population genetic variation when you have a lot of data. So this is a structure or admixture analysis. It's a very, very uh, popular tool uh, for population genetic analysis. And for example, if you go down to K equal three here, the kind of thing that people are looking at, you can see it, may, it might be hard to see, but there's, um, if I highlight that, there's a po population um, here that's the represent Middle East. They just grouped a bunch of people from the Middle East. And you can see that that has sort of a little bit of African in it and then more European. And so the way the people interpret it is saying, oh, these people are somehow admixed between people of African ancestry or European ancestry. Of course, it might mean many different things. It doesn't have to be that they were admixed. It could just be that genetic variation is really a continuum. It's not discrete uh, populations, but that would be the traditional interpretation of, of, this kind of uh, these kind of observations. That's structure on mixture analysis. Another very important uh, type of analysis that's often used are principal component analysis. And the way that you make principal component analysis is that you take all your individuals and then you calculate a covariance between your individuals. That is sort of a measure of, of how uh, re related the individuals are. That's one way to, to think about it. And then you do some linear algebra, you uh, diagonalize uh, the matrix, you find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then these uh, tells you about components, genetic components that some sense can be used to describe independent components that can be used to describe the genetic data, which would be the different uh, eigenvectors uh, that you have. And then you can plot them out. Often you make a plot, you take the two first, for example, and then you make a plot. And, and then you can put people back where they fit in this space. Now you've made it into sort of this two dimensional, reduced everything to a two dimensional space with two axes. And you could take people back and say, on this two-dimensional space, where do they fit? And one of the sort of most famous figures in population genetics is this one, where people realize if they did that and then they rotated the axis of the coordinate system in the right way, then you could get this great correspondence between the actual geography and then the distances between people in this two-dimensional plot. You can see here people from Spain, a dark blue here, um, people from Russia and Ukraine, have this green color over, over here. People from Great Britain, they're pink here. Um, Italians are brown down here. And if, if you rotate the coordinate system just right and stretch it in the right way, it really mirrors quite well the geography. So genetic variation in Europe to a certain degree mirrors uh, the geographic pattern. Maybe not surprising, people living in close proximity, they tend to be more genetic related to each other than people that are distant. And if that's true, then you get a pattern like this. So that's principal component analysis. Of course, PCA analysis is sort of the, one of the basics tools of statistics and 
it has been existed for many, many, many years, but it's really uh, been very useful in population genetics, but just more sort of exploratory analysis and for ways of visualizing the relationship between individuals uh, in two dimensions. And that's primarily how it's been used, but it's also used in other ways. So let me finish like just talking a little bit about uh, some examples uh, of what's um, some, some data analysis. So this is just pulling out for some projects I've been involved with, helped with. This is from some work out of Escobillis' lab in Copenhagen. He had this sample from, from what's known as the Kenwick Man. That's uh, a, a, a sample that was found in Northwestern United States. And it's quite, it's, it's many thousand years old, but uh, the skeleton by looking at it, some people are claiming, ah, maybe that was actually European. And there was massive con controversy about it because people looked at the skeletal features some people say it might be somebody from Polynesia. Other people you see they made this reconstruction up here in the right corner of somebody that was European. So were there Europeans in North America? People thought that. So Escobillisle, what he did was he sequenced the genome from the bones of this individual. And then he did various analysis. And then one of them is, is this structure plot down here where you can see you have different populations that are represented. Europeans are over here in yellow. Um, and Han Chinese from China are here in blue. And these populations over here, these are some Native American populations. And here's a Kenwick man over there. And one of the things you can see is that the genetic composition here is just like the Native Americans. And that doesn't seem to be any evidence of any European in him, really, more than what you would think get by random noise in all of these other Native American populations. So from that analysis and several other analysis, including it. PCA plot up here, where again, you can see the Kenwick man, he falls in together with people from North America. The Kenwick man was a Native American, like Native Americans that are there today. And in fact, relatively closely related to modern day Native Americans. All right, um, I think I had more things I want to go through, but I think I'm going to uh, to end with that uh, and, and, and stop there uh, today. But I just want to end by, by saying that these type of analysis where people have used these methods, both the sort of simpler methods where counting mutations, doing PCA plots, structure plots, but also these more sophisticated methods trying to fit more explicit models, has really changed our view of human history and learned, and we learned a tremendous amount of what has happened in human history and when it happened. From the out of Africa events to how people got into the Americas, and when they got into Americas, how European populations were formed how we think the Indo-European languages, how they spread. Uh, many, many, many questions like that have over the past five, 10 years really been answered uh, in human genetics, thanks to all the new data that's been generated and all these new methods for doing data analysis. All right, so I will end with that. Um, and But here, if there are any questions that are missed. No, people are too shy for questions. If you have a question, also feel free to send me an email or contact me otherwise with a question, I'll be happy to answer it. And otherwise, I guess uh, we'll end for today. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Uh, yeah, I really hope that by the next lecture, there will be a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, see you next week. Yeah, thank you again, Rasmus. Sorry, can you make me a host? Oh, yeah. Let me I'll make you. a host. Now your host. Yeah, so thank you again and see you soon. All right. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye, Rasmus. <laughs>